least three or four pages. It mm -hmm. simply says that no member of Congress should be permitted to directly solicit a campaign contribution for their own campaign, for their party, for a PAC. It's a rule that applies to many state legislators across the country. In 30 states where judges are on the ballot, it's a rule that applies to them. And I say this, we, we all know about the amount of money in politics. This is about the amount of time it takes to raise that money. It is less campaign finance reform and more congressional reform. It says instead of spending 20 hours a week or more fundraising, let's spend 40 or 50 hours a week doing our job in Congress. So the STOP Act would prohibit direct solicitation by a sitting member of Congress for any campaign contribution. If it only prevents sitting members of Congress, then what does that mean for challengers? Okay. So initially, I thought we would include challengers, right. and the idea being both get back to work and also let's remove some layer or appearance of impropriety. Right. The whole notion or suspicion of undue influence. Right. A, a very smart political friend of mine said, if you include challengers, this could be misinterpreted to being an incumbent protection bill. Right. right. Because naturally unsolicited contributions might be more likely to come into incumbents right. than they ever would challengers. Right. So notionally, I do think it should apply to everybody because it does begin to get to the undue influence question. But for reasons of extracting any <coughs> resistance uh, to the STOP Act, we left challengers out. Right. And so let's talk a little bit about resistance then. Um, how, how is the effort going to get this passed? And what kind of arguments have you encountered against it when you've been trying to solicit uh, support? What are, what are you hearing? Well, you know, I, I would uh, like to compliment my colleague, uh, David Jolly, here for this initiative. And I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it. Uh, it is a bipartisan initiative. That's right. And as David uh, was pointing out, there are really two sides to this. One is the... Um, the, the, at least the appearance uh, of an impropriety. Uh, members sitting on a committee calling people whose jobs and professions and occupations could be affected by the committee and asking for money. And a lot of people find that offensive. Um, they find it inappropriate and uh, David and I agree that, that indeed it is. But it's also about process, uh, as David pointed out. Um, if uh, so many of the members of the Congress of the United States are across the street in Republican and Democratic call centers uh, dialing for dollars, well then guess what? They're not on the floor of the House of Representatives. So process is also an equally important part of what we're trying to accomplish here. We want the members of Congress to go to Washington and go to work on the people's business, not go across the street and raise money for their own reelection. Now, um, um, you know, I've got a little perspective on this, having served in the Congress back in the 70s. There were no Democratic and Republican call centers across the street. Um, I don't recall ever calling anyone uh, uh, and asking for money, and I don't recall any of my, my colleagues. And it was a time when um, everything came up through the committees, uh, under open rules. Right. Uh, everybody got a chance to uh, vet their ideas, have them argued, have them voted on. Uh, you know, you can argue whether or not the results were better or not, but I tell you what, people felt a lot better about it. Right. Everybody's comfortable losing a, a good argument if they had if they had their their day in the sunlight. Um, and that's what this is also about. It's about getting us back to regular order. Go to Washington, go to work. Don't go across the street and dial for dollars. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what happens when you do go across the street and do this dialing for dollars. Um, now, obviously, there are you know contribution limits to uh, campaigns. You can donate $2,700 per election. But when you call these people, are you asking for $5,400 or are you saying, could you give $5,400 to me and $5,000 to the PAC and right. $33,000 to the right. party committee? Like, what really goes on there? So I would say I don't make those phone calls. Right. Um, I, I took the pledge to no longer do it back in January. <clears throat> and I think every advisor would say it's crazy. Perhaps it is true. Uh, but I took the pledge knowing that if we could really have an opportunity to move the stop act, we needed to show it was more than just a simple proposal uh, legislatively. But to, your, to the substance of your question, so sure, $2,700 is the personal limit, but that's for a primary and for a general. So there's $5,400. If they're married, that's 10 8 And then there are PAC contributions, 
And as a result of a spending package about two years ago, the national parties are now authorized to raise money, I believe, for a building fund yeah. and a few other specialty funds. And I don't know what the max is, but it's several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, if you look at some of the presidential candidates, for instance, I think uh, when Clooney had his fundraiser, I think the price of admission for the VIP experience was $430,000 perhaps. Yes, something like that. And yeah. I believe that's from a, either an individual or a couple. This is not a thousand people raising that money. That's essentially a single donor. So there are limits of $2,700, uh, but there are so many other ways that individuals can contribute politically. And you better believe the best fundraisers know each way to get those donations.